We're in the series called Compelled to Replicate as we're walking through what it means to disciple people, what it means to be in discipleship relationships. And a lot of times you hear that term and there's no definition. Here's what we mean, helping create disciplined pupils in relationship with Jesus. That's what we do when we talk about discipleship. And this morning, we are walking through what I would call is the fourth tenet. So just so you know, as we started the series, we've had weeks upon weeks that are building upon one another. And we've talked about different tenets of discipleship that doesn't become, well, I do this one on Monday and this one on Tuesday, but it's more of a filter. It's more of a filter that if I'm going to invest in someone or even be invested in, what am I looking for? The first week, we talked about teaching. And this idea of actually helping people understand the word, teach it in context, to walk through things. But one of the blessings of teaching is you don't have to be a master teacher to disciple. You just have to be good at facilitating a conversation. Because we hear a lot of information, don't we? Get a lot of information. We get the word taught on Sundays. Possibly we have our own devotionals. We go to Bible studies. We listen to podcasts. We're getting the word a lot. But what the teaching really has to do is more of an encouragement to get you to do something with it. Teaching is not instilling information. Teaching is making the learner want to learn more. And so that was the first week. Second week, we talked about accountability. That's scary for some of us. And some of us are like, I need that. And accountability is, is, the truth is, we do better when we know someone's watching. And the hope with accountability is not that we would just sin less, but we would pursue Christ more as we have people spurring us on. The third week in the series, we talked about life on life. What it means, not just to be vulnerable, but to actually rub off on one another. And the truth is, more is caught than taught. And so that's why we walk through life on life. And today, we're in the fourth, there's six, we're in the fourth tenant, which is mentorship. And for a lot of us, mentorship, we start to think that that is discipleship, but here's the truth. Mentorship by itself is incomplete. You need these other tenants, plus two that I'll talk about over the next couple weeks. Mentorship, according to Webster's Dictionary, is the guidance provided by a mentor, especially an experienced person in a company or educational institution. And I get why that's how we see it as mentoring, and that's true in a secular sense, but today we're going to be talking about it from a biblical perspective. Mentorship is about guidance. It's about giving advice and direction to someone. But that someone must, hear this, this is pretty important because if you miss this, Everything I'm about to say isn't really going to matter. That someone must ask for guidance. You guys picking up what I'm putting down? They must ask for it because if they don't ask for it, all of a sudden we're just talking at somebody and they're not really going to do anything with what we've told them because we're forcing our opinion and guidance upon them. No one can say, I'm such and such mentors without someone actually asking advice or asking for counsel, asking for guidance, and then taking that guidance and putting it into practice and then asking for more. That's what mentorship looks like. It is when guidance is taken by the mentee and then there is this consistent consistency with that person to ask for more advice or guidance that that person becomes a mentor. So here's why I'm harping on this. Mentorship and discipleship are not the same thing. Mentorship is a piece of discipleship. But if all you're doing is being mentored, it's incomplete when it comes to being discipled holistically. So I'm going to take you to a passage in Acts chapter 8. The book of Acts is the Acts of the Apostles, the Acts of the Holy Spirit through these people that Jesus had sent out to go preach the gospel throughout all of Asia Minor and through Jerusalem and a bunch of other places. And we pick it up in Acts chapter 8, and we're going to hear about a guy named Philip. He's the only guy that actually gets the term evangelist on his name. There were the evangelist, but then there was Philip the evangelist. And now, an angel of the Lord, this is in Acts chapter 8, verse 26, is where we pick it up. It says, now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out. And on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Candace, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet, and he said this, do you understand what you are reading? What a phenomenal question, Philip asked, in my opinion. 
Verse 31, his response was, how can I? Unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is profound, church. Because the Spirit is leading Philip to go stand by essentially the eunuch's parked car. And if you're standing by my car, I'm like, hey, what are you doing, right? And he goes and the Spirit leads him to it and he hears him reading Isaiah, Isaiah 53 in particular, I read ahead. And he's reading Isaiah 53 out loud and Philip hears this and he says this amazing question, do you understand what you're reading? And in some translations, so this is NIV, in some translations, the the treasurer's response was, how can I unless someone guides me? How can I unless someone mentors me? In another translation, mentorship can come from many types of people. I have mentors in finance, automotive endeavors. I have a mentor in Marvel Comics. I'm just putting that out there. And what we are talking about, though, when we're studying this and teaching this from the text is we're talking about mentoring as a piece of discipleship. To mentor is to guide others through the Word. Don't miss that. To mentor is to guide others through the Word, through the mentor's knowledge of the Word, through interpretation and their own experience. But the Word ought to be of first importance. Because our worldly advice will never be as helpful as the very words of God. Are you picking up what I'm putting down? Because we can say, oh, well, I would recommend we do this. You should do this. But what this text is saying and what we understand is we need to point people to the actual word of God as the treasurer was reading Isaiah. So I want to take you to an epistle. Anyone use that word this week? The word epistle, it simply means a letter. And this letter is written by John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. So we've been studying John for like the past 200 years, personally, as a church. And we are going to 1 John, and then there's 2 John and 3 John, and then he writes another book in the Bible. What is it? Yeah, you guys were quick. Revelation! Yeah, totally, yeah. And John not only wrote this book, 1 John, but he wrote it to a church as an encouragement because they were starting to have different heresies come into the church. And there's three themes in the book of John, which makes sense based on the passage we're about to read. John really focused on true doctrine, true teaching, biblical doctrine. He focused on obedient living, and he focused on fervent devotion. And it's very encouraging to this church who is being persecuted through false teachers and heresy that was attempting to discredit and persuade followers away from the gospel. An early form of Gnosticism, we've used this term before because many letters that are written in the New Testament were fighting against Gnosticism, this, this Gnosticism that uh, matter was bad and that Jesus didn't physically rise from the dead, but he spiritually rose from the dead. They tried to, tried to lower Jesus' superiority. And this early form of Gnosticism had been attempting to subdue the power of the gospel and distract people from the truth. That's when you know it's a cult. So John is speaking to the church in a very apostolic, God sent him out, they saw Jesus alive after he died, in an apostolic and advisory kind of role. With the authority of God's as he speaks the truth of scripture, inspired by the Holy Spirit, but he's also in the role of an advisor to the people of this church that he's writing to. So we're going to start to go verse by verse. Verse, 20, uh, verse 1 of 1 John 2. He starts with, my dear children. There's something beautiful about just the way that he writes to them to encourage them with what he is writing. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. A child of God's has the power to flee from sin. Do you guys agree with me? If you have the Holy Spirit in you, if you have the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, you have the power to flee from sin. You have the opportunity. But I would go as far to say that you have the responsibility, if you have the Spirit of God in you, to acknowledge and confess your sin. I would say you have that responsibility. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, earlier on in this letter, he says, if we confess our sins, he, God, 
is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. Hallelujah. But not only that, purify us from all unrighteousness. I'm pretty unrighteous. I don't know about you. And yet, the text says that he is faithful. Now, I'm going to say a statement. I hope you understand it. Confession requires faith. It requires faith. The faith to believe that we can put ourselves out there enough to have someone see who we really are. If we cannot confess to God, if we cannot confess to people, we probably aren't heartbroken over our sin, which means we're probably not repentant. And in the 21st century of the church of Jesus Christ, here's the thing. We don't have an acknowledgement problem. We say, God bless you. We talk about God. We speak of this, what I would call the hallmark God, where it's totally cool to talk about God, but you start talking about Jesus and people start to get uncomfortable. And we have this God that a lot of the world acknowledges, either as a higher power, as a tree, as, as a man who walked with flesh. We acknowledge God. We do not have an acknowledgement problem, church. We have a repentance problem. Because too many of us aren't actually focused on the fact that if God came and intervened and did for us what we could not do for ourselves, we now have the opportunity to confess and repent, and the world sees that. Do you know how evangelistic it is to see someone repent? Do you know why we do baptisms? Because it is actually the ceremony, if you will, this ritual, if it, you lean that way, to show others that you've repented, that you've gone from death to life. Hallelujah. And so just like a wedding, you all could just go down to the courthouse and get married, but many of us, when we go to get married, we choose to do it in front of other people to show others that we're going to make our marriage about our God, and we want other people to experience that, and so we do the same with baptism. So we don't have an acknowledgement problem, we have a repentance problem, and we are unwilling to grieve or lament over our sin like we should. And when our heart really is downcast because of our transgressions, confession relieves us of having to hide it or wonder who knows something about us that we don't want others to know because we're willing to confess it out loud. Verse 1, again, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Verse 2, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also the sins of the whole world. Okay, we're going to have to do some business up in here. Because this verse starts to lead us towards things that create heresy because we don't understand what he said. This advocate, this great high priest, this stander in the gapper, if you will, has become the one that makes it so that you and I can be purified. Because of his blood, we are cleansed from our unrighteousness. He stamps us as righteous, not because we are, but because he is and we are with him. But John uses the words that can create a misunderstanding of God. He uses words that can create a misunderstanding. We can misinterpret what he meant about salvation. Some will read into what John says when he says, not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world, to mean that this gift of salvation just extends to everyone if they acknowledge it or not. That everyone's just saved. Everyone's my brother or sister in the faith, even if they want nothing to do with God, which seems ridiculous. But to mean that, his gift of salvation extends to everyone, everywhere, for all time, without any expectation of change in that person, that salvation isn't a gift. That's a cheap imitation of what God actually provides. Here's the thing. No one deserves Christ. No one deserves Christ. You don't, I don't, we do not deserve Jesus Christ. No one deserves salvation, yet Christ intervenes, and some enter into a relationship with God through Christ because of God's grace. It's not a real sermon unless I quote a dead guy, and then John Calvin said it this way, and not for ours only. He's talking about this verse. The reason that when John wrote this, uh, Calvin has this commentary on this verse. He says, he added this for the sake of amplifying in order that the faithful might be assured that the expitiation made by Christ, the atonement made by Christ, extends to all who by faith embrace the gospel. 
Expitiation, uh, atonement, it means to make amends, if you will. When you go to someone, you say, hey, I screwed up, that, that's making amends. Christ's death and resurrection was enough to make it, hear me, so anyone from any place at any time could repent and trust the gospel. You're not more evil than the cross is gracious. Do you hear me? I need that. He made it so any person at any time in any place could trust the gospel message and that they could understand that their sins can be forgiven and that they can be adopted into the kingdom of God. So how do we know if we've come to know him? Check it, verse three, it tells us. We know that we have come to know him if we attend church on Sundays. Hold on, I, I uh, what's this? We know that we have come to know him if we do ministry on our college campus. We know that we have come to know him if we're on some member role at a church. No. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Keep his commands? This word keep, here's what it means, because, you know, had to nerd out. Keep comes from the understanding of a guard keeping watch over a fortress. This guard is keeping watch. He is making sure that if anything's happening, he's going to see it. And we keep lookout. We obey our orders from our master, King Jesus. Not out of have to, but out of get to. This is what God's people do. And so I don't know what you're hearing, but you might think, well, I don't keep his commands. You know what? I don't either. Most of the time, I am absolutely failing at this. I've had to apologize to many of you because I've failed over and over and over again. But this is not about perfection. This is about progress. This is about pursuing him and doing what he says. And the more that we pursue him, crazy. We start to look more like him. I got one message. That's it. Christ did for you what you couldn't do for yourself. Repent and grow to look like Jesus. That's my message. So you come here, you're like, what's Tim going to preach on? That. That's what I preach. But so does the text. Ironically, like a lot of things, and I want you to keep your eyes on this verse, ironically, like a lot of things that the Bible teaches, it exposes where we are, it exposes where we stand based on our reaction to words in the text. Because this is what's expected of a follower of Jesus. This isn't what's expected of a Pharisee, because a Pharisee is trying to earn their way. This is what's expected of a follower of Jesus. So when he says those who know him keep his commands, he's saying that the byproduct of knowing him is you have the power to do what he says. So verse 4, whoever says I know him but does not do what he commands is a liar. Huh. And the truth is not in that person. Now, I'm a bit of an exhorter, if you haven't noticed. Like, I like to, like, tell people how it is. So I love this verse, but here's the thing. I'm a liar. And this exposes that. Because so often, more often than not, hear me, I don't do what the text says. More often than not, I don't listen to what my God says. More often than not, I know the scriptures and I have an opportunity to make this choice or this choice. And which choice do I make? Not the one the Spirit's leading me to do. I'm a liar. But oh, how good is it that grace extends to a liar like me. John doesn't mince words here. He tells it as it is. And honestly, as I get invested in by others, I need honest voices to speak into my life like this. I need people to tell me, bro, you're missing it. Bro, when you got up there, you made that sermon about you and it should have been made about Jesus. I need people, now that doesn't mean email me. Leave me alone. No, I'm just kidding. But I have lots of voices in my life, people that are watching to make sure that I don't get off track because I could draw other people in that same direction. So he doesn't mince words. In other letters in the Bible from Peter and Paul and James, they actually say the exact same thing, but they use a different term, and we've studied this term before. So instead of saying you're a liar because you don't keep his commands, what they say is you've deceived yourselves. You've miscalculated your faith. You've made Christianity about something that it's not, and you've spent a lot of time going through the motions, and you missed the point. John calls out the fact that people that claim Christ 
but don't listen to him or guard or keep his commands don't actually know him. They are liars. They are posers. They are masquerading as followers of Jesus. And I don't know your hearts. I'm not saying I'm like, oh, okay, you showed up. All right, well, you're one of them. And then you. No, I don't know, but I know what the text says. And I know that that's some of us, unfortunately. But the truth, the gospel, the logos, has not intervened in a person's life if they're unwilling to obey his commands because those who know him do what he says. Not perfectly, but progressively. Verse 5. But if anyone obeys his word, oh, this is good news. Love for God is truly made complete in them. Love for God is evident in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. It says, those who know him obey his words. They keep his commands. They fixate on God's word. And they fixate on God's guidance rather than the world's guidance. They are the ones that have the love of God abounding in them because they are in relationship with God. So, uh, real talk. We misinterpret what this means all the time. Because we're a religious church. We're starting to do things based on maybe something we were taught before and it's never really changed in our hearts. God's never really given us the eyes to see that maybe we're more fixated on a religion than we are in a relationship with Jesus. So we create in our own minds a religious expectation that in order to start a relationship with Jesus, in order to be justified by Jesus, you gotta do stuff. You gotta work your way to him. You gotta clean yourself up. Look around real quick. You all look good, just so you know. Sunday best, love it. But you don't need to clean yourself up. Because if you clean yourself up, the world will just make you dirty. But if God cleans you up, you have a new heart, a new life, and a new soul. It's being revived and changed and resurrected by Jesus Christ. This is not what John is trying to teach us, that in order to be justified, we got to do stuff. In fact, this is not what any of the Bible is teaching. We just misinterpret all it. So New Testament writers, what John and Paul and Peter and Jude and Mark and Luke and the writer of Hebrews and Matthew all point out is that those who have had God intervene, those who have come into relationship with God, they obey. Not to justify themselves, or not even, let me speak into another theology, not to keep their right standing. Well, I better obey or God's going to take away the gift he gave me. No. We obey when we truly understand that our sins have been forgiven, not because of us, but because of Christ. We obey, and it's because of the advocate of Jesus, and you obey him out of want rather than have to. So once you know him, Your want to know him and grow to be like him becomes a priority. So so real, uh, again, just being real specific. If you've been here a while and you've heard the preaching, you've heard about growing in the likeness of Jesus, but your priority to look more like Jesus has not changed. It's not progressed. You're not more excited about growth in your own personal life. Take a few steps back and look at, do you know the biblical Jesus? Because evidence of knowing him is that you prioritize looking more like him. That's why we obey. Not to get into heaven, but because heaven's gotten into us. John's letter here is not a list of do's and don'ts. It's not a letter, it's not a letter based on what you got to do and what you can't do and what you better not do. It's not do's and don'ts, it's about done. Jesus came, made it finished. He's done what you don't. Jesus has done what was necessary to satisfy the wrath that our sin deserves. So when this realization takes over your mind, when it takes over your heart, when it takes over your soul, you want to obey. You want to grow. You want to be like the one who did for you what you could not do for yourself. So you must, or really you do, live like Jesus lived when your heart's been transformed by the gospel. You start to see people the way Jesus saw them. You respond the way to people the way Jesus responded to them, like flipping over tables. No, I'm just kidding. 
You engaged the world the way Jesus engaged. He cared for the lost sheep. He cared for the people that were without a shepherd. He cared for the people that were stuck in the grime of their sin. He didn't tickle ears, did he? And there's no program that will ever give you the tools to live like Jesus lived. It is only the redeeming intervention of God that can point you on a path towards spiritual growth. It is only God intervening, the Holy Spirit coming inside of you and changing you from the inside out. Roll the song, just kidding. So when someone comes to us for guidance, do we give them diet advice or do we give them the gospel? Okay. I think we're too impressed in the church of Jesus Christ with information retention. I'm just putting that out there. I think we're too impressed by the people that know all the Hebrew, all the Greek, and can say, well, in this context, and I'm all for expository preaching. I'm all for bringing out things that maybe you've never seen before, but I think we've started to look at the wrong target. We hear someone that can quote scriptures or uses really big words, and we symbolize them as the spiritual target. Hear me. The target is Jesus. He's the target. And he is unattainable in this life to be like, but as we follow him, as we obey him, we have glimpses of imitation of him. Not perfect, that's glorification. That'll be when you're done breathing and you've been received by Christ. But as we follow him, there are these glimpses that all of a sudden the things that we used to do, we don't do anymore. And we're so fixated finding our identity and our sin that we miss the fact that God wanted to give us his identity as children of God. And so when we sin, we go, oh, God conquered that sin. And then we go back to it and we think God didn't conquer it. No, 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 you went back to it. But the Spirit of God gives you the power to repent and change direction. The hope is that we see the Spirit of God transforming people into the community of Jesus Christ, into his church, into Christ-likeness. But you know how that doesn't happen? Through spiritual elitism, based on information regurgitation. You know who did that? Satan, quoting verses of Jesus out of context. Well, he knew a lot. Jesus was not impressed. And heresy in the early church didn't come out of people serving other people. Okay? Stay with me. Heresy in the early church, it didn't come from people serving other people like cults do today, or through compassion, or through worship experiences that are not biblical. It came through distorting the truth to get people to follow the wrong path. So glad this has changed in the 21st century. Verse 7, dear friends, your children, now dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. Let me remind you of what I've been telling you. This old command is the message that you've heard. This message is not new. To love God means to obey him. You want to get simplistic? There it is. To love God means to obey him. And this has been true since the law was given to Moses. This has been true since Adam and Eve broke the covenant that they had with God when they didn't listen to him. This has been true for a long time, but the thing is that we can't obey him and we don't obey him on our own. So God sent his son. God sent, here's a fun word, the propitiation, the atonement, the payment, and the figurehead and representation of who and how to follow and obey God. So John isn't writing a new command. He's illuminating the need for people to understand the necessity of the old command. You guys picking up what I'm saying? Verse 8. Yet I'm writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him. Guess who he's talking about? Jesus. And in you, because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. This term, uh, new command that he used, it can also be interpreted as a daily renewing of this command. It's a daily renewing of the reminder that Jesus ought to be at the center. Don't put him him first. 
Because you'll just do a daily devotional in the morning and then you'll go live however you want. Make him center. Because everything you do, if he's center, you're doing it with him. So the way that you love your wife, the way that you love your, your husband, the way that you care for your friends, the way that you take care of your kids, it's all central on Christ because he did for you what you couldn't do for yourself. That's Christian life with Christ at the center. And John references truth, light, and darkness. And truth, the fact that we worship here, the fact that we spend our Sunday mornings instead of being at the 408 race, the reason that we do what we do is because truth is found in the person and the work of Jesus Christ, and that's been illuminated to us. The Old Testament, which many Jews had seen as their sacred writings, it was a foreshadowing of the person and work of Jesus, and it was leading towards what the Messiah would do for his people, for you, if you've received him. And those who have received this message of the Messiah being the king, it's not just one who has an intellectual understanding of this, but life and truth has been made known to them while they are representations of light in the darkness. So what's darkness? It's the absence of light. And this is what it's like to be united with Christ. You have the truth in your inner being, and you are part of the light that overtakes the darkness. Hallelujah. Verse 9. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates brother or sister is still in the darkness. All right, Tim, now you're just meddling. I was good with that other stuff, but now you're talking about how I treat other brothers and sisters? Why? I don't like them. My preference is not to spend time with it. Now, let me be clear. Paul didn't like John Mark, all right? They had some words, and there were some issues. But we're not talking about liking. We're talking about loving. We're not talking about disliking. We're talking about hating. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates brother or sister is still in the darkness. I want this verse to sit for a bit because I am so guilty of this. This is something that mentor after mentor after mentor has had to speak into my life because of how important to grasp this reality is. So the brother or sister, it doesn't signify the world. John in particular is using language for siblings because when you're adopted into the kingdom of God, your God the Father is your father, and we, if we've been adopted, are brothers and sisters. So he's using languages for siblings, for those who have been united by Christ and adopted into his kingdom. So even though hate is wrong, so don't just hate someone, you know, don't hate anyone, necessarily. Hate sin. But what John is focusing on is hate for another redeemed follower of Jesus Christ. So John is saying that if you do not, if you identify yourself in speech and in deed with Jesus Christ, but you hate another brother or sister, your claim to be part of the light is false. You've deceived yourselves. How can John make such an emphatic statement about our deeds when we are not saved by our deeds? How can he say if you do this, then you're not saved, if you will? Because what we do shows who we belong to. What we do shows who we belong to. And not loving those who also have been redeemed by God may be a telltale sign that really we don't understand redemption or grace because you didn't earn it. I didn't earn it. Verse 10. Better news. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light, and there is nothing in them that makes them stumble. But anyone who hates, oh, bad, bad news, but anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness, they do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. I imagine someone who's in darkness not knowing it. They're walking around, running into furniture, going, who put that there, right? And not realizing that they literally cannot see. That's what it's like to walk around when you have not had the Word of God and the Spirit of God be open to your mind, to not have the eyes to see spiritually what God is actually saying. And the religiousness in us is to just keep trying to work our way to Him. Well, I'm just going to make Him proud. You want to know what makes God proud? Faith. And guess who gives you the faith? God. Way to go, God. 
So when people are trapped in their sin, they would rather justify themselves. They'd rather justify their sin than be open to the truth because the truth has been hidden from them. Verse 12, I am writing to you, dear children, there it is, dear children, friends, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. Those who have come into contact with God and responded by faith to his grace have their sins forgiven on account of what Christ has done. So here's the thing. My hope as Church of the Valley, for those that are saying, yes, this is the community where I'm growing, my hope is that we would invest in one another. And that because of Christ, no matter what someone is going through, that we wouldn't miss the opportunity to point them to three things, and if you're taking notes, write these down. To point them towards their identity in Christ, point them towards their identity in Christ, point them to the forgiveness of their sins, and point them to their adoption into the kingdom of God. Can I just be real this morning? I was pissed off. Can I say that? Okay, fine. I didn't say that. Agitated. All right? But I came here and I was getting stuff kind of thrown at me that I was like, I'm, I want to preach God's word. I don't, like, ask me on Tuesday when I, you know. And I was just, I was in this, this space and, and Pastor Mike and I, we prayed and he prayed over me and he encouraged me and it was just this moment of just, I just needed a brother to stand in the gap with me. I just needed a brother to go, Tim, it's okay. And the thing that reminds me at the end of the day to keep going not, not just being a pastor, but being a son of the God most high is because my identity is not found in what I do. It's found in what Christ has already done for me. What I get to remember every day when I sin is that God has forgiven me of that sin because of what he's done for me. I get to be reminded when I feel like a latchkey kid that has no real family because all my family except for my married family is gone that I've been adopted into the kingdom of God and I'm part of God's family. Better than those things. And so when you're encouraging someone, you take them back to the fact that their identity can be found in Christ. Their sins have been forgiven because of Christ and that they are adopted into God's family because of Christ. Oh, that's good news. And so John writes to instruct and guide those in his care not to just believe, but to behave in a way consistent with their belief. Don't just say you believe, live like it, is what John's saying. And this admonishment is not only biblical, it's practical and it's realistic. To hate someone but to claim love for God, you miss the purpose of who and what Jesus came to do. Jesus came for sinners like you and me not just the ones who seem to be decent people, but he came for the worst of the worst, y'all. He came to make us trophies of grace. He came to change us from the inside out because our God is that big and he can show off by taking people like us and making a new creation. Oh, do I need this. So how should you be in order to be a mentor? What should you be like? You don't need to be an expert. You just need to be a good example. That's gold. You don't need to be an expert. You just need to be a good example for people to point them towards Christ. Paul's writing to the pastor Titus in Crete, and he, he says in chapter 2, verse 7 through 8, he's talking to him about his example and what he ought to be doing, and he says, in everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned. Dude, you guys can condemn me for how I live. I do things wrong all the time. But the truth is that I want to point you back to the one who changed me. If we're just looking to throw rocks at people from behind the cross, it's because we don't understand grace. But... What Paul is telling Titus, this one who's leading and setting an example, is that when we teach, when we admonish, when we encourage, when we point people to the text, do it with integrity. If you've taught a text out of, out of context and then you realize later that you did and you knew who you said it to, go tell them, hey, you know what? I messed up on that. And seriousness and soundness of speech 
that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Most of the stuff that's said about other people, I'm done, supposedly. Most of the stuff that's said about other people is based on preference. You're not like this, you're not doing this, why didn't you do this? And then all of a sudden, it's not about admonishing, encouraging, and helping restore that person. It's about you wanting your preference, like, like one of my kids. Eh, I want to go to McDonald's. So be someone who points people to the word, who's also learned from your own experiences. Tons of mentors. And most of my mentors, you know what's valuable to me? They're mistakes. I've learned so much through my mentor's mistakes because they realize they're messed up. So to be a mentor means you have something to offer someone else spiritually, and often that needs to be offered through the word of God and what you've learned. I used this verse last week when we installed elders. It was written by the writer of Hebrews through the Holy Spirit. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate Isn't that what we talked about last week? Imitate their faith. So a real simplistic, logical thing. In order to be a leader, people have to follow you. Otherwise, you're just out for a walk, okay? That's that's what that is. In order to be a mentor, people must follow your guidance. We all need these. And this isn't about me. I'm just telling you, I'm, I'm in desperate need of voices. I have many, many, many mentors. Here's what I'm asking of you. Have some. Have one. Have a few that speak into your life, that can call out the blind spots that you can't see, hence the name, that you can ask advice to, that you can study scripture with, have people. It takes a village to raise a disciple, and that's why we have a community. And we all need these. Last thing about when it comes to being mentored. Come ready to be teachable. Come ready to ask questions. Come ready to take notes. Guys I meet with, either you were given a notebook by me or at some point you realized, oh, I should probably take a note. Come with a notebook. Ask someone out to coffee. Ask them out to do something, hang out with you, and ask them questions and take notes. So if you want a, if you want a mentor, okay, if you want a mentor, if you want someone to invest in you, you want someone that you can go to for guidance, if you want a mentor, come prepared to be mentored. Have mentors who are good examples rather than just voices who know something you don't, but are good examples. So maybe you're scared to disciple. Next week, we're going to walk through the actual nuts and bolts of, so what do you do with someone? How do you invest in them over caffeine? Because that's part of it. And we're going to walk through that, and here's the bummer about next week. Here's the bummer. You're going to be without excuse because it's a really low bar. But maybe you're scared to disciple. Maybe you're not ready to actually take on someone as a responsibility and invest in them and and help them be taught and accountable and have life on life and be mentored, and then the other two we're going to study the next two weeks. Are you too scared to mentor? Because discipleship and mentoring are two different things. Can you at least be be someone who's available to guide someone else? Worship team, why don't you come on up? I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to do a real quick commercial, if you will. God, I am so grateful that your word says that your word doesn't come back void. So... May my ego, may my want for amens, may my, may my care for people hearing what I'm saying not overshadow the work that you're doing in souls. So God, I ask by the power of your spirit that those who heard what your word said today would put into practice what they learned, not just quote what they heard. And God, we thank you that as we as a community get to worship you in the word and in music and even giving, God, 
You take all of these things and you produce in, it, through your spirit disciples of Jesus who look more like you, but I thank you that you give us the church to do it together. So Father, may you be praised.